I, I, uh, hi, I'm Bhaskar. I've been working on Erlang since uh, 2007, when I had the freedom to do whatever I wanted on my own startup. So I chose Erlang. Uh, prior to that, like, like a lot of people who get introduced to Erlang, sometimes they get, start working with eJabberdy or RabbitMQ and then have to debug something or implement a plugin. So, um, so again, my uh, you know, first brush with Erlang was uh, with uh, eJabberdy. And uh, right now I uh, work at HelpShift with the event pipeline where we handle, you know, like hundred, like billions of events uh, that go through Erlang uh, every month. So I just want to start off with a sort of historical overview of, since the talk is about recursion and why uh, sort of tail recursion is important, especially in Erlang. So uh, there was a, con so going back in, uh, you know, dialing back uh, in history, uh, there was a conference in 1955 called o Automatic Computing, where, you know, in Germany, where they decided that, okay, we need to come together and uh, standardize on, you know, future improvements and so on. So, just hold on. Yeah, so they, so uh, the, the group at ACM also got involved because they wanted to have a sort of global sort of unification for, uh, machine independent algorithmic language. So this is basically the formation of uh, the uh, of uh, BNF actually as a standard. So the goals of uh, you know this IAL or the language was that uh, it had to be you know rep be represented mathematically. Uh, you had to be able to put this in publications, uh, you know, be print print at the time, and it should be able to be represented as programs. So uh, during this phase in the in late 50s, a lot of progress actually happened. Uh, you know, so they agreed actually on BNF at this time, um, and uh, they renamed it from IAL to ALGOL. Uh, and there was a lot of uh, it was truly a world sort of uh, you know international effort because uh, you know there were like 50 centers and uh, close to 100 people working on. Uh, you know, from compiler creators to language designers. So it was a real unification of uh, unified effort. But that said, um, um, you know, it also uh, formalized, you know, things like pass by value and reference. And it introduced a lot of things that made them a little uncomfortable as well. So some of the things that you, we actually take for granted today, you know, was actually laid, the foundation of that was actually laid in those uh, committees there. But that said, it wasn't all rosy. So there were clashes. For example, in, the, in Europe, they used to uh, use comma for like 100,000 or and in the U.S. they used to use period. So, you know, since it was a unification effort, you know, sm small silly clashes like that, uh, ranging to more complex ones like, uh, so at that point, you know, Lisp had already been introduced uh, and uh, they had more industrial sort of experience. Um, and in fact, uh, John McCarthy had already introduced uh, recursion in Lisp. And he was trying to actually, uh, so that community wanted to actually include recursion, uh, you know, in the spec you could say. Um, so, but at that point, it, I mean, nobody knew, I mean, uh, at least in Europe, they were not, uh, you know, as welcoming um, about, you know, uh, formalizing on that. Um, but uh, Dijkstra actually, uh, so it's actually like a, pretty much like a Bond movie. So secretly, you know, uh, you know, we have these 70, 100 people, you know, collaborating on something. And then suddenly in the last, and they published this committee report also. And then Dijkstra just says, hey, let's add this one sentence, uh, you know. Uh, the exact sentence was uh, to add recursion, you know. Uh, just one sentence he added without anybody knowing. Uh, so, so basically, you know, whatever was implemented in that report, that was, that was what language creators and all that after that would have to do. So he wanted to actually make sure that was in there. And, you know, this is, uh, again, so that's how recursion was added in a sneaky way. Um, and, uh, you know, some people resigned in protest. They were first, you know, a lot of people, they made gali over ISDs and all that for the first time. And, uh, uh, but, you know, it, overall it was a, uh, considered a success and, uh, you know, international effort for uh, a standard for defining programming languages. And I'll see how this, uh, show you how this whole algebra, uh, algebraic uh, language was used in Erlang later. But, um, uh, but for that, let's get into the history of Erlang now. 
So Erlang, uh, its origins are, uh, uh, it was actually created in 86, but there's a little more history before that. Uh, so if we could call Joe Armstrong, you know, let's say employee one of Erlang, uh, you know, he sat in a room and, you know, people said, okay, fine, go play with your toys. So that's what the guy that Ericsson basically said. And um, the challenges that Ericsson were basically telephony. Um, yeah. So uh, usually when you think of creating a language, com coming up with a language, right, you, you think of, you know, what are the goals, you know, uh, you know, do I tick, how many of these things do I tick off? Like, uh, you know, it should be expressive and robust or object oriented. So, uh, with Erlang, none of this happened actually. So, he didn't actually have this huge master plan of making, you know, the world a better place and all. The only goal of actually Erlang was uh, concurrency. And everything that happened actually was an after effect or a consequence of choosing concurrency as the only goal. Now, why was it number one? Because think about it. Uh, so you're a telephone exchange, okay? Now, if there are two telephone calls happening, and you put your phone down, doesn't mean another phone call to go down, right? So that is like the basic sort of thing. So you have multiple phone call conversations happening, and uh, they should happen independently. If one failure and one happens on event in one, should not affect another one. So that's what crosstalk pretty much is, if, you, if that happens, actually. So, uh, so the so the common thing is like uh, it's it's quite obvious you know they should not share anything like whatever I say on one call you should not go on the other call um, and uh, so the concept of you know uh, message passing uh, in fact actually K has its origins with this like simple concept of uh, what we see in telephony and uh, so Joe Joe Armstrong actually uh, saw inspiration in things like uh, abstract machines. And uh, it's not that concurrency was invented at Erlang either. So now, although concurrency was the first goal, uh, like I said, um, there were other languages, uh, you know, which offered concurrency. So you know, and in fact, he had actually go gone through the papers of all uh, these other languages as well. And he's, it, he actually got inspired by different things that each of them had. For example, the fault tolerance, like when, when something bad happens, somebody else should be notified. That came from a language called Plex. And um, so now the, uh, it, I think uh, in another year, it was 1987, the team had grown to two people, doubled, doubled the team. And um, so they already had these sort of uh, goals. So even, they hadn't even started writing uh, Lang yet. But these are the goals they already had. So the programming languages properties are that, it, that uh, basically depended on, it should take, sh it should not take time to create a process. Uh, the time to perform a context switch between processes also should be less. And uh, since they are, you know, happening independently, the message passing, uh, let's say if I call you, you know, obviously that should be fast. So uh, it moved to then three employees and they were working on, um, so they were still not working on Erlang yet though. It was just conceptualizing, and uh, uh, at this time though, so they used to actually uh, read all these papers, and uh, it still wasn't prevalent that uh, to use concurrency, and uh, you know they still were in a world where semaphores and locking and so on were prevalent. So in fact, there's a funny incident where these three guys who were in, uh, responsible for Erlang went to a conference just like this, and then asked the speaker, okay, uh, you know they're like, okay, I want to learn functional programming or see how concurrent systems are uh, designed. And they actually asked one of the speakers, hey, so what will happen? Like, okay, I send something like this, and one of them dies, and what will happen? So the typical reply was, uh, it won't die. Or, uh, you, know, uh, you know, we can't do anything about uh, things going down. So that sort of, uh, uh, you know, taunted them. So uh, now here's where the, the algebraic, uh, no, algol's sort of role comes in now. So Joe Armstrong then went ahead and uh, started working on uh, uh, small talk, okay? And uh, so in fact, he didn't even write a line, uh, start working on small talk. First, he just wrote uh, his vision of, uh, you know, this message passing in, in that algebraic language that came in the 50s. So now because he wrote it in that uh, algebra, 
uh, another prologue engineer who happened to be walking around. He just said, hey, I can implement this. Because one of the, the goals of the BNF was that you can translate into a program. So this is where sort of, you know, a full cycle comes around. Now, if they hadn't make that, added that uh, decision of adding the BNF, Nalgol, maybe we wouldn't have had, uh, had Erlang today. So Joe, he started looking at programming, uh, actual, you know, programming now. So he picked um, small talk and then uh, he then moved to a prologue because, you know, this, this guy clearly, uh, uh, his colleague knew a bit of a prologue. Uh, and then, so his first experiment basically was, uh, I mean, and what the algebra talked about is, uh, you should be able to, uh, die, like every number you hit in the phone, uh, it should, uh, this was running on the simulator, of course, but um, every number you dial, it should, it should, it should message pass to the exchange. And uh, when you dial a valid number, that is, it reaches all four digits or all five digits, then it should uh, dial on the other side if it is a valid number. And if it is busy, come, you know, reply back saying it's busy. If it's not busy, ring on the other side. So these are all events that are actually sent to and fro uh, between, I mean, you could say actors. Uh, but another way of thinking is, uh, of this is it's actually more like state machines because these are uh, actors which are alive and they could get an event pretty much at any time. And uh, it should, like, for example, how do I know when uh, I've dialed a complete number? So you dial one. So let's say that the valid phone number is five digits. So it's a state machine, which first takes one digit, then two digits. When it reaches five, then make the call. So that's a tip. So that's the reason why uh, you know you could actually they actually realized very early that uh, things like call control was best modeled using state machines. Now. Um, now it is still 87, and then they finally decided that uh, they would start writing in Prolog. Um, and uh, they started patching, uh, you know, and uh, writing extensions on top of uh, Prolog. Eventually uh, named the language, uh, uh, somebody uh, actually, one of them made, uh, named it Erlang. And here's the irony. Uh, now even, they started off with concurrency as a goal, and, and, and in, his, in his own words, you know, Joe Armstrong said that we didn't realize that at the time, but that uh, copying data, okay, sending between processes, it increases isolation, increases concurrency, and simplifies construction of distributed systems. So this is a, in retrospect, actually, you know, this is a consequence that he actually realized when he started off with doing one thing right. So you can actually, uh, you know, go on with, uh, there's a lot of interesting history. So I stopped at 87, but actually, uh, you know, there were, there's a lot of interesting uh, uh, things that you can actually check out. Uh, there are three different papers actually by the first three employees at uh, the Erlang team. Uh, you can, I'll, I'll probably, uh, yeah, uh, actually I have a link I think over here. And uh, so there were times inside, so uh, initially the Erlang Ericsson team told them that you have to, I mean they benchmarked this, uh, you know, uh, the first version and said it had to be 40 times faster. And uh, you know, then they made it 200 fa times faster. They said it had to be, you know, 40,000 times faster. I mean that's the kind of replies that, uh, uh, they kept uh, pushing for internally. And then there was a time where, you know, it was actually banned. Uh, and it was doing well, but then uh, for some reason, some business decision, they banned it. So he just changed the name of the thing and uh, continued working on the same thing. So he says that, uh, you know, if you want to continue working on something that is banned, uh, take, uh, just change the project name. It will take at least six months for the management to realize that you're still doing the same thing. So. You can check out these papers, uh, like the true story. This is by Mike Williams, uh, Williams who's employee two. Uh, true story about how we entered the Erlang. Um, the Joe Armstrong's uh, history of Erlang. And uh, Robert Wording, uh, history of the Erlang VM. So I, I mean, if you want to read more about this, I recommend you check this out. So let's now move into, uh, you know, under the hood of uh, recursion. Now, and tail call optimization. So you might, uh, you might have come across, uh, you know, factorial and functions like this, where at the end of the program, you have something like return n plus uh, fact of n minus one or something. So that's one way of doing it. Uh, but a tail call optimized 
uh, version is basically not having to remember what to do, where to return to. So this is pretty much like once I call that last function, it forgets everything that happens before, like gadgety. So every time it enters that function, I don't know what is happening, or what happened before. So uh, can anyone say the output of R of three? Let's spend some time look at this and you know, give me the output of R of three. Now this is not a uh, lang, but yeah. So let's just uh, see what happens. So R of three. Uh, so if you look at the code, it three is not one. Therefore, call three into R of two. Uh, two is not one, so call two into R of one. And uh, so it goes. It sort of goes in deep and then comes back out. So. Uh, that's your typical, uh, this is a recursive function, but it's not tail optimized, tail call optimized. Now let's see the, the comparative, uh, the tail recursive version. Now this will also give you six, but uh, you notice that you pass in state, state over here. So this will also give you six, but uh, you can just look at it and sort of see the difference now of the call stack pretty much. So, um, so let me give you a sort of non-programming example, but something that actually uh, will help you uh, understand as well. So let's say we have an example of uh, a program that must go behind three doors, open the door and see if there's paper outside, okay? Paper outside the door. Uh, we'll have the procedural approach, a recursive approach, and the tail recursive approach. Now, pardon my drawing skills, but I spent 10 minutes on this. <laughs> okay, so I go behind door one. So this is, let, let's say you have a function, three different functions, like function one in blue, function two in yellow, function three. So you call them one after another. Now this is how the call stack will look like. Each of these steps is called a call frame in the call stack. Okay, so let's say fun, fun of one, fun of two, fun of three. If you uh, just call them one after another, this is what happens. It goes into fun of one, see the, if there's paper outside, comes back. Then goes into fun of two, is the paper outside? No, come back. Then three goes, see if there's paper, comes back out, done. Now, this is another way. So there's three doors, but if you open one door, you see another door there. You, then you go through that door. And there's another door inside that. Okay, so you finally, uh, these, these are doors, by the way. <laughs> Okay, uh, so you walk in and you see that there's no paper there, okay? And then you come back closing the doors back. And finally there's another version where suddenly uh, he goes in but finds a back door. Oh, there's a back door there. I don't have to come back all the way. So this is basically the procedural approach. Um, the recursive uh, approach where you go in and then come back out because you have to remember where you were. And the tail recursive approach is you don't, you don't have to ever come back. So you finish the functions and that's it, you're done. So many of you might, you know, already see the advantages, so maybe disadvantages of this as well. So if we come back to this example of the two snippets, now both of these definitely are recursive. Okay, now you can actually just look at the example on the right and see, you know, it, it just looks easier to run off in a different message independently. Because I can compute that without doing anything, like without looking at anything else. Whereas on the, uh, the first example, it's tough to, I mean, you have to go in the same order, right? You can't suddenly uh, uh, change the order also. So, so both are recursive, yes. Um, the first one is easier to do, you know, debugging and, you know, seeing your uh, backtraces as well but you can't change order. The second example, uh, it looks easier to paralyze. Um, and speaking of paralyzing, now uh, there's an important law that we need to uh, know. So, I mean, something that a candidate for being, uh, you know, paralyzing is that it should be sufficiently independent. Now these look sufficiently independent, uh, which is where uh, Amdahl's law comes into the picture. That is, uh, does anyone know which year he uh, 
did this? I have to check that up. But the speed up of a program using multi-core is uh, limited by the time needed for the sequential fraction of the program. So you are as good as your weakest link if you had a ball Hollywood version of this. So uh, that's pretty much what it's saying. So in your programs as well, um, even if you are you know concurrent and parallel and all that, you are always bottlenecked by actually the stuff that is not parallel or not that cannot be made concurrent. Okay, so you should think about those. I mean, uh, regardless of the language, actually. So yeah. So speaking of uh, you know parallelizing, I think it's a good time to move into uh, spawning or forking. Um, uh, so now, when you think of forking, the first thing that comes to mind is you know demonizing and demons. So I think it's uh, is it fair to say that a demon is a long running process? Or you know, or uh, yeah. So let's look at a rough skeleton for a demon in C. So many of you, uh, you know, might have come across or written some boilerplate for doing something like this. So for the most part, you're in, uh, you know, the parent process, and you know, at the end of forking, uh, you know, uh, the execution is now in the child process. Uh, so this is in C. Uh, now you you can try this out right now. So just do brew install Erlang or sudo apt-get Erlang. Uh, create a new uh, example foo.conf.erl and type this out. This is like the pointless, the most pointless daemon you can have, but it is a daemon nonetheless. That's all it is. Now if you have seen the examples I gave you earlier, this does not reference anything before. It basically calls. Uh, like we are tail recursive calling tail recursive again. So it is recursive. There is no, no, I'm not doing a one plus something. It is tail call optimized. And so this is tail recursive. So it is tail call optimized and it is recursive. Um, so actually um, this is, so tail recursive, that's how it's actually a fundamental part of a process because uh, anything that is, uh, so a process is actually a tail recursive function. All process. So un the the moment it stops being tail recursive, the process dies. So that's how you stop a process. Uh, so just to see whether I was actually uh, bullshitting, I uh, decided to write a test. So I have foo. Uh, can you guys see the example? Yeah. So there's foo and there's bar, and uh, foo. So I just wanted to see that if I run these two functions, what's going to happen? Okay, so uh, a lot of you might think, okay, the scheduler, I mean, usually if you do a while loop, right, while of one, you know, do something. Uh, you know, that's in C, I mean, you come across that. Uh, so in, in Erlang, the whole, uh, the CPU uh, sort of uh, scheduling, uh, is actually dependent on the number of cores in the machine. So Erlang today is already can scale to how many ever cores you have on your machine. If you have, let's say, a quad core, you have four schedulers, all right, and each of them can will take care of the parallelizing. So I ran this example, and you can see X and dots. So it's it's it wasn't as though it was like constantly getting uh, you know ch chugging on that one foo bar a foo function or that one bar function. Um, so, again, you can see it's it's tail tail call optimized. It is recursive, but it is swapping between foo and bar. And I didn't do anything here. So, the scheduler. So, uh, in fact, uh, SMP eight eight. That's the number of cores and therefore number of schedulers. Okay. So, um, so if uh, so, yes, indeed, the smallest. So these are in fact the smallest demons that you can do. So now you can actually just think, how do I do a long running process in something like, uh, I don't know, Java or, or you know, any other language you want. So this will run for years. So that, that is in fact the, the goal of, uh, like Joe Armstrong said, to run concurrent processes that run forever. That's the only goal he had. Um, yeah, so Erlang scheduler, uh, like I said, there are eight cores here. If you run Erl, this is what you get basically. URL hit enter, you see that, you'll get that information. Uh, now, uh, now you'll see the the function spawn over there. 
uh, that's how you create a, uh, that's a reserved keyword to create, so if you say spawn of a, any function, that function will now run Sorry. as a, a new, uh, on a new process. So you can decide, it's, it's now in your hands how many processes you should have. You know, you can decide whether a job should run on process one or process B, whether the, the, the intent of running the job can be passed around and then it can be run on that process. So it's, uh, it gives you these uh, decision making uh, uh, powers and that, that's why it's actually really uh, powerful. Um, just a little word on spawn again. Uh, so if, you're, if I ran child daemon, it will run forever. I, you can check the memory, there won't be any, it won't go out of memory, that's another thing. Uh, if I want to fork and then start a daemon, that's all I did. So spawn of, that is I want to run child daemon as a new process. So if I just ran chi child daemon right now, um, I won't be able to basically be blocking my current process. So if you open the REPL, that's your current process. If you run child daemon there, it'll block your current, uh, basically it's running in your current process. So you would do something like fork. And uh, that's how the spawn reserve keyword works. Um, so uh, like I said, I mean, in, um, another, Thing that you'll find that if you uh, you know work with Erlang, it's actually quite expressive to mix and match like this. So, um, so here's a function called get OK. At the end of uh, which it returns OK, uh, but it calls these uh, foo and bar. So, so, yeah. So let's see what foo does. Um, uh, so another word about uh, processes now. Uh, there's another reserved keyword called self that will give the current process identifier. Um, so whatever you run, as if it doesn't fork into a different process, it's running in the same function. So if I run add, subtract, divide, it's all running in the same process, unless I message pass and then the uh, flow continues somewhere. So even though they are running a different function, it's still the same process. Uh, and like I said, the process will s cease to be alive when it stops being tail recursive. So if it returned uh, get OK, it would keep running forever. But in this case, it returned an expression, uh, you know, OK here. So um, now this is an example of uh, something called guard clauses. It's sort of like a polymorphism, you could say, which you see in OPS. Like if bar gets the uh, value 0, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, I forgot to write foo here, but foo is actually just giving uh, uh, okay. Because yeah, if I ran foo, uh, this foo, it would run forever. It would never uh, enter, I mean, go out of foo. So uh, foo also must uh, return in, uh, a value. So I, I should probably uh, update this. So uh, yeah, if bar look like this. So here's an example of uh, doing something. So bar, all I want to do is do uh, something with uh, the numbers 10 to 0. Okay, so this is, these four lines basically uh, do, th uh, that's what it does. So um, you see there are two occurrences of bar. I've, I've sort of defined bar twice. So bar of 0 and bar of x. So what that does is, uh, you put your special cases of functions above, saying that I'm calling bar, but if it, the value of x is 0, then do this, okay? And for everything else, do, uh, do something else. So, uh, yeah, do something x, just this, something uh, random. A any questions about this? Uh, here's another example. This is a complete sort of example. So if you do app get install Erlang and put this into your editor, so uh, firstly, uh, the module and uh, Erlang uh, uh, file name have to be the same. So this has to be uh, eg1.erl. Okay, so I have do something. So let's just see how expressive uh, this is. Now I want to do something every second. Okay. So do something prints a dot. Wait for a second, that's how I implement it. Okay, time or sleep of thousand. Uh, and we know how a daemon is. Daemon is just 
call a tail recursive function. So what would a do something every second daemon look like? That's exactly the last three lines there. So it calls do something, which prints a dot. It waits for a second, time or sleep. And then it calls the same function again, tail recursively. So this will again run for months. I mean, I, I can do send some logs, I can check some metric, I can uh, check for connectivity. I mean, this is like the smallest daemon you can think of. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so that you have the ripple, access to the ripple. Uh, so, yeah, for that, the, a process has to be told that uh, it will receive data. So, when you say message passing, okay, we haven't got to message passing, but uh, so let's say you have process A. Okay, it's running tail recursively. Uh, for it to receive data, there's a particular uh, keyword called receive. So, uh, like I said uh, earlier, a process will be alive as long as it's either tail recursive or if it's waiting for an incoming message, in which case it'll go to sleep. So if it is, uh, if I have a receive block, which is the next function actually, uh, here's a function called receive, okay. If I write, uh, let's say, do something and then uh, receive, this will actually wait here until somebody sends it a message, okay. Um, so any other, so uh, like I told you, um, to, let's do a typical client server sort of example. I do spawn of one function, I do spawn of another function, okay. And uh, if, uh, as long as I know the process identifiers of each, I can say send message to this process identifier and he'll receive it in the receive block. Okay, so here's another small example, increment of x, increment, increments plus one, Increment till 100, okay. So all we want to do is go from uh, uh, 1 to 100 forever. Oh, yeah, sorry, this example, uh, yeah, that's fine. So if I call increment uh, till 100 of, uh, let's say, 0, it'll call, it'll go 1 till 99, it'll go to 100. But now I put a guard clause over there. So when it reaches till 100, it'll go back to 0. So again, and now you can put a timer inside. So example, uh, so every second, you know, go to 100. So you can, you can really com compose very whatever uh, things easily like this. Now uh, at the bottom here, so receive and increment forever. So uh, to your question of, okay, let's say uh, if a process can receive something. Uh, now this process, if I run a receive uh, at line 54, it will get a message and then die because it's not air recursive. But in Six, uh, in 62, it receives a message and then again rec rec calls receive forever. So this is a tail recursive function that will receive anything forever. So tail recursion as such you can see it's great for making daemons. But when you add, a me uh, you know, message passing, so it's like it can send forever. It can receive forever. It can, and then when you add network programming, it's like even more mind blowing. So you can like connect two things. Uh, it's great for doing things like retries, uh, you know, uh, and basically anything. So tail recursion and network program is actually a great combo. Uh, now, yeah, speaking of network programming, uh, here's like, I don't know how readable this is, but uh, uh, okay. So these, there's some library modules, uh, you know, called gen TCP. So in two functions, you can get a server. So let's first make a TCP server in our line. So that's a f uh, line number 46. Okay, so it says listen on port 8021 and then accept. Okay, so this will, uh, if I just stop my code at uh, 48, uh, so it will actually, as soon as I connect to that port, uh, it will die, the server will die. Okay, why? Because it is not tail recursive. If I stop, uh, that is, if I don't end with a tail recursive function, it, that server listens only once. Now in this case, I have a, uh, I don't, uh, yeah, so is, is function on 52 uh, receive and reply, it is not tail recursive. So what will this do? Uh, it will receive a TCP packet, it will uh, echo it, 
close the socket and then look at line 57. It is not tail recursive because it doesn't call the same function again. So it will receive on packet and die. Okay, now uh, let's now combine everything. So on line 64, you have uh, something that receives and then again always receives. It's a, it's a receiving loop like uh, we showed in our earlier example. Now the function on 64, uh, no sorry, 60 will receive forever. Uh, the first function listens once. Uh, the second function replies once. And we have a sort of uh, semantics of how to do something forever. So which brings us to uh, the last two functions. That's a TCP server that listens, replies forever, okay, on a particular port. So I'll just uh, run this example. I can uh, just run this. Mm. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's what it, this thing that I. So this is a opens uh, a socket to that server we just created, and it gets back echo foo. And this is the code basically for that. Keyboard shortcut. Okay. Um, so uh, now, how many of you think this is hard to read syntax? I mean, is it maybe? I mean, for me, it looks pretty. Uh, there's not too many, too much boilerplate, actually, if you ask me. And once you understand the semantics, like uh, how to receive one message, how to lo loop forever. Um, you know, then when somebody says that uh, all lang is hard to read syntax, nah, that's my response. <laughs> okay, now, uh, all right, so, uh, okay, so, yeah, so I talk, talked about, we talked about recursion, tail recursion, tail recursion with a receive tail recursion that receives forever, right? Uh, and then tail recursion uh, with a network programming. That is tail recursion with socket, you know, so that will actually do clients of a uh, network program. So it was uh, actually Leslie Lampert, uh, Turing Award, uh, and, you know, considered the father of uh, distributed programming. He actually said that if you are not representing your, uh, uh, you know, uh, distributed system as a state machine, then you're do, doing something wrong. Because, uh, you know, anything can happen basically. Because, you know, connection can go off, your internet can go down, some error can happen. So just having, you know, send and the next line receive, you know, uh, maybe the API can eventually do that, but under the hood you should be implementing a, a state machine. For example, I've uh, opened, a, I'm attempting to open a socket to, uh, to a server. Now, uh, now, uh, Helpshift has a, how many of you have heard of Apache Kafka? Yeah, okay. So we have an in-house Erlang uh, Kafka producer. It's on GitHub, uh, helpshift uh, github.com slash helpshift. So, um, so there how it works is that, uh, so in Kafka, you have concept of topics and you can publish to a topic. So. Um, so everything is done very lazily. Uh, as soon as so as soon as you start Eka, that's the name of the program. Um, it actually you can start immediately say Eka publish to this topic uh, this message, and it doesn't it it it'll take that message. It'll buffer it because it'll attempt in the it, meanwhile the state machine will attempt connecting to the Kafka uh, actual broker, uh, and until the connection is established. Uh, and you get metadata back. Uh, so it's still buffering. So the state machine is actually holding state and it's all transparent, but under the hood, uh, you know, it handles disconnections and immediately it, it stops workers. Uh, when the connection reestablishes, it starts act a lot of actors. 
uh, you can actually, uh, um, you know, so, so it's actually a very, uh, so uh, when anyone asks me, you know, uh, to implement, uh, a, let's say, a DB client or whatever client, if you're writing a, a library, you should really consider uh, FSM, uh, state, state machine. And here's where Erlang's OTP uh, comes into the picture because OTP gives you a ready-made sort of uh, uh, boilerplate where you can just say, uh, basically it's a, it's a boilerplate sort of skeleton for making state machines or client servers or whatever you need. So you, you can just work on the logic. For example, when I, guess it, when I get X, do it X plus one. That's all you have to say. Okay, and then, uh, um, and then you can say, when I get uh, this event, then do change the state, state to that. Uh, when I get a TCP close, uh, do some re, re uh, attempt or uh, reconnect. So you can actually give, it's a, a fairly, very simple language, you could say. Uh, it's a sort of meta, uh, it's, it's a boilerplate uh, Erlang sort of um, uh, module where you can clearly define the, how your state machine should operate. So, uh, so that's gen underscore FSM. You can, uh, you know, search online for those examples. So just to uh, uh, sort of in conclusion for, you know, the, how much time do I have left? By the way? Okay, great. So to conclude, we saw that uh, tail recursive function, because they don't have to, like we saw the door example, where you enter three doors and you don't have to come back. So there's no increase of the call stack. There's no memory leak. Uh, so which is why, uh, it's, you know, tail call optimized recursive functions uh, are the foundation of processes. And as long as a, pro a function is tail recursive, the process is alive. And we saw that when, once it returns any expression, the process dies. Um, so processes, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's actually the foundation, foundation for state machines. And uh, state machines is basically the foundation of building distributed systems. So it's rather, and that's why actually you say Erlang is great for distributed computing. It's actually because of, you know, one, each of these factors. So, you know, so in a way you could say, you know, Erlang is, you know, great for distribution. But under the hood now, you know that it's actually because of uh, tail recursion. So uh, I have actually another extra part, which I thought I'll just go through if I have time. I think I have. Um, now, uh, this is nothing to do with uh, tail recursion, but more with concurrency. So for example, if you have a producer Oscar? consumer problem, like uh, let's say you have a stream of incoming numbers, and you want to publish them concurrently. Oh, Bhaskar, parallel. so uh, regarding tail recursion, right? Yeah. So I understand the point of using it for, uh, you know, to to run a process and keeping it alive. Yeah. But on the factorial program that you showed showed yeah. earlier, right? Mm. So the the expressiveness was slightly lost, isn't it? So when you see x x into you know f of x minus one, yeah. is more clear. It looks like a mathematical notation. Uh, that was an Erlang, but uh, that was like a typical sort of C uh, example. Okay. So. so No, I'm talking about. You know, oh, that example was in Erlang. Uh, that is a uh, That was that was C. So, uh, my um, the, my question is actually for tail recursion yeah. it should not be used that way, right? Uh, yeah. If so if I do f of uh, like uh, in Erlang also, you could have a factorial function that says fact of uh, n is fact uh, like n into n into what fact of n minus one. You could you could do that, okay? But it's it is recursive, but it's not tail recursive because. Like I said, uh, with the wait, wait, where's the door example? Huh. So, with recurs, so with recursion, where you do n into n minus one, I mean, pack of n minus one, it pretty much has to go through each of these doors, and then once it's done, it has to come back out, right? So, uh, whereas the tail recursive is uh, where it has everything it needs to go forward, it never has to come back. So, okay, let me come back to this. So, yeah, if you have a stream of numbers and you want to, uh, you know, uh, in parallel, some send them somewhere, you know. So, one of the uh, drawbacks of, uh, uh, let's say, parallelism on, in this case is that it could go out of order, actually. This is something 
if th this might be an acceptable uh, uh, sort of a drawback. Uh, in our case, when we're getting like, uh, you know, slight, uh, first of all, in, uh, for this Kafka producer, we uh, send them, we get them, we batch them, and then we send them, uh, it doesn't really matter because it still goes in a, in a second or two, it doesn't, but maybe if it's like something mission critical uh, where order is important, uh, you might have to have a, a, sin, a sort of a, a bottleneck. So one process that actually gets everything in order and then send it. So you have the power to actually make these kind of decisions. Um, yeah, so these are different uh, uh, so socket thing also we saw. Okay, I'll just go, go through uh, some examples then. I, I think I'm pretty much done, so. Yeah, I think I'm done, so thanks. Uh, we can move into...